Welcome to Vintage McCoy. I'm Rick Brown standing in for Rob McCoy and I'm so glad you're with us for a hard-hitting segment as we share with you how to stand against tyrants. Tune in. Kairos, this is your moment. Liberty is not man's idea, it's God's idea. We must participate in the public square. This is a moment in time that will define history as we know it, the furtherance of America as we know it. That's a powerful gift, freedom. And we're not going to bow to tyranny. This isn't me standing, it's us. This is the moment for the body of Christ. We pray that there would be an awakening and a revival in the nation. In Jesus' name, amen. In this edition of Vintage McCoy, we're going to go around the world with you and share with you the importance not only of keeping your eyes wide open and your ears wide open, to absorb the information that's going on. You know, Jesus exhorted his followers. He said, you can tell the weather as you look at the sky, but you don't discern the times that you're living in. God's people should be on the cutting edge of observation, intuition that is spiritually inspired as we observe current events and everything that's going on. And being willing to stand as Christians and as United States citizens against tyrannical leaders as we'll do a panorama, if you will, around the world. But we have some good news to start with right here at God Speak Calvary Chapel in Newberry Park, California. And that is this week after the Supreme Court decision that Praise God, we still have a bit of a conservative voice that supported the Constitution, that the Ventura prosecution that has been pressing charges against us for meeting for simply church, worshiping the Lord, teaching the Bible, loving people, enjoying communion, baptism, all the things the church has been doing for 2,000 years, and wanting to fine us and drag us into court and calling us super spreaders and all of those different things, we sigh a big sigh of relief this week as they drop the charges against Godspeak Calvary Chapel and Pastor Rob McCoy. <laughs> Can you do a little bit of dance, huh? Huh? That's good news for us. But to our neighbors to the north, after we get a moment of good news, I, I got to share with you some hard stuff. Because our neighbors to the north in Canada, who have a similar constitution to us, we want to give you a bit of a brief update on Grace Life Church with Pastor James Coates, that he just got out of jail for 35 days for simply having church. And after the 35 days, he preached on that following Sunday. And right after that Sunday, <laughs> check this out, that 200 heavily armed police reportedly moved in on Grace Life Church in Edmonton, Canada, after part of the state-constructed fence which prevented the congregation from accessing their building was removed by protesters. Hundreds gathered for peaceful worship outside the grounds on Sunday after Canadian police and Alberta Health Services installed a double fence around the church's property in an effort to enforce a closure around issued... Uh, order issued back in January. So look at the soldiers in this picture and check out this clip. Keep it calm. They tore down the fence, the congregation, and then Afterwards, had a change of mind and began to rebuild the fence with the authorities. Talk about a topsy-turvy confusion for everyone involved. Look at this. Oh, 
This just happened this last week. It's unbelievable what's going on in the world around us. Because you see, you have to stand up to tyranny wherever you find it. Now, you may have to pay a price, like Pastor Coach. You might have to go to jail for 35 days. You may have to uh, be fined, as Calvary Chapel of San Jose is at $2 million in fines. Or you may be drug into court and threatened and called super spreaders and everything else like we have here at God Speak. But with all of this that is unfolding before us, how do you and I step up and make a stand? Well, also in a church in Canada, a Polish pastor that was un behind the Iron Curtain who came to Canada for the freedom to worship the Lord according to the dictates of his own heart had a confrontation in this last couple of weeks himself. Look at this clip of him telling the health officer and the police officers to get out. Please get out. Get out of this property. Immediately get out. Okay. Get out out of this property immediately out i don't want to hear anything out of this property immediately i don't want to hear a word out 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 of this property out of this property you nazis out out gestapo is not allowed here immediately gestapo is not allowed that's some bold preaching <laughs> to the authorities of the land that they were trespassing. They did not have a warrant to come into his church and shut it down as they were. And he was standing with his rights as a citizen, but also very boldly in his Christianity. Some people think as Christians, they misunderstand meekness as this effeminate, weak, flimsy, just roll over whatever we're told to do, like a puppy dog. Sit up. Beg, roll over, lay down. But meekness is power under control. Christians are the best citizens of any community that they're involved with. They pay their taxes. They love their neighbor as themselves. They want to share with people how to love God and how to love the people around them. They preach forgiveness. They preach peace. They preach uh, joy and peace. All of those things. But when tyrants want to rob us, of the freedom to worship, or they want to rob us of our rights as citizens, Christians are not meek individuals as, as far as weakness goes, just to roll over and be compliant. But that's what we see in America across the board in the majority of churches and mainline churches, large churches, small churches, and they actually ha are joining with the state to condemn Christians that are standing up to be passionate about their walk with God. And we have a word of exhortation to all that, uh, if you've never been behind an iron curtain and grew up, this Polish pastor was on a brief interview with Fox News. Look what he has to say. Yesterday we showed you this remarkable scene. A policeman in a supposedly civilized country busting into an Easter service and attempting to close it down, uh, which was in fact an illegal act by those coppers. In this case, the mass ranks of the constabulary didn't measure up to one determined pastor and he cast them out of his church. That preacher joins us now, Arthur Palowski. Uh, pastor, it is great to see you. You're joining us from Calgary, where the those nice Canadian police uh, suddenly invaded, and you, you basically, through the sheer force of your personality, threw them out of the uh, temple, and it was a wonderful thing to see those guys uh, retreating down the stairs. What's interesting is uh, you grew up behind the Iron Curtain, and what happened to you uh, over Easter is exactly, I take it, why you didn't want to stay behind the Iron Curtain. That's exactly, sir. Thank you so much for having me. I grew up under communist dictatorship, behind the Iron Curtain, under the boot of the Soviets. And I'm telling you, that's no fun at all. Um, mm. It was a disaster. Uh, police officers could break into your house five in the morning. They could beat you up, torture. They could arrest you for no matter 
what reason they would come up with. There was a famous saying in Poland when I was growing up by the police, give me a man and we will find something on that man. So it was like a black, uh, you know, flashback when those police officers showed up at my church, everything kind of came back to life from my childhood. And the only thing I could do is to fend off the wolves as a shepherd. And I used my voice to get rid of them. They were illegally uh, encroaching on our rights during the most holy days, during the Passover celebration. Uh, how dare they, uh, the audacity of those people coming. It was a shocking thing. I was a little bit shaken, uh, but I did what every shepherd right now on the planet Earth should be doing, fend off the wolves. We as lions should never bow before the hyenas, and that's what they are right now. What a great example of somebody standing up as a citizen of heaven and a citizen of his country now, Canada, coming from the background that he has come from. You see, the thing is, is bad ideas lead to bad policies that lead to bad politicians. And those bad politicians then force good police officers. I want you to know that we are pro-law enforcement. We love police officers. We love firemen. We love first responders. We are 100% behind them. Obviously, as there's this big hubbub about defunding the police, there's a few bad apples in any barrel of anything you want to talk about, but the majority of police officers joined up because they want to be of service to their community, and we're very supportive of that. On the other hand, what is tragic for me to think about those politicians that have bad ideas and then they have bad policies, and unfortunately, the policemen have to enforce really, really bad policies. And that's what's going on right now as we think about these things. It's not only churches. You see, up north, and this is why it's such an important example, because it is on our northern border that these things are taking place in Canada, because it's all under the guise of COVID-19. And yet, we would think as a freedom-loving a Republican or a de democratic system as they have up in Canada, but <laughs> the quarantine, the internment camps, if you travel into Canada, which six months ago they were saying, if you hear these ideas, it's propaganda, it's conspiracy theory, not so. Tucker Carlson, as usual, uncovers what's going on up north, eh? Canada? took a dramatic move toward legitimately dangerous authoritarianism. In Canada, yes. Here's just one measure of it. On Monday, the country's prime minister, Justin Trudeau, outlined his government's new corona regulations. Canadians hoping to return to their country must be tested before and after takeoff, he said. Quote, if your test results come back positive, you'll need to immediately quarantine in designated government facilities. This is not optional designated government facilities. Now, when this happens in other countries, and it does, we call those facilities internment camps. But because this is Canada we're talking about, a place we assume is passive and polite and Anglo to the point of parody, no one thinks to use that term. In fact, no one thinks about it at all. Trudeau's internment policy has been in place since last month. And as far as we can tell, no major U.S. network has even mentioned it. And neither has our State Department, which ordinarily seems to exist to make unhappy noises about human rights violations around the world. But not a word about Canada. Preconceptions may play some role here. We assume that interning people is what Russia does. Boring people is what Canada does. But not anymore. Suddenly, Canada is a flagrant violator of the most basic human rights. Fail a COVID test and they will lock you up without trial and go ahead and try to disobey. According to the Canadian government, anyone who attempts to avoid these rules, detention in a government internment facility, for example, could face a million dollar fine and three years in prison. This is Justin Trudeau's Canada. It's funny, Trudeau always seemed like a cheerful idiot, wearing weird costumes and yammering on about diversity. Who knew he was Mussolini? There might be a lesson here for other nations that are led by shallow neoliberal empty suits. Know any? Underneath all the chirpy identity politics talk, it's not a joke. It's internment cells. 
In Canada, where everything has a euphemism, those cells are referred to as approved quarantine hotels. What are they like? Well, as noted, they're internment cells. What do you think they're like? There are shortages of food and water. You could be sexually assaulted as you're held in one. Listen to a member of the Canadian Parliament explain what they're like. The Liberals instituted a federal hotel quarantine requirement for those entering Canada. We have heard reports that it is taking hours to get through to book these hotels, dietary restrictions are not being met, and food and water is not always readily available. That's in addition to this program continuing after reports of sexual assault. This is mind-boggling. Oh, the Liberals did this. It's not very liberal to intern people, is it? According to a report in the Post-Millennial, the doors in many of the internment facilities don't lock. Detainees have no way to protect themselves while they sleep, hence the sexual assault. They also don't have access to adequate medical care. In one case, Canadian authorities detained a man with diabetes called Ray Truesdale. What was Truesdale's crime? Well, it was flying from Tennessee to Toronto on a business trip. As he waited in confinement for his corona test results, his jailers forgot to feed Truesdale for more than 24 hours. Ultimately, Truesdale left his cell and went downstairs in search of something to eat. And there he found others who were being held without food. They were screaming, he said. In the end, Canadian authorities informed Truesdale that his coronavirus sample had been damaged somehow, so he had to remain in internment. Or consider Mitch Bolu, a Canadian who landed in Calgary after a business trip to Florida. He told Canadian television the experience was very much like a kidnapping. He was put, quote, in a black van with tinted windows and taken to an undisclosed location. Where am I going, he asked. Why am I going there? The response, we'll tell you everything when you get there. He thought it was a prank. He thought it had to be, but it wasn't a prank. Quote, I got out there and there was plastic all over, people walking around in hazmat suits. It was like jail, pretty much. Yeah, just don't call it jail. And that's an order directly from Canadian state media. This fall, the CBC, Canadian state media, ran a story with this headline. Prime Minister health officials warn Canadians against believing COVID-19 internment camps disinformation. Warn them against believing. Sound familiar? That claim, that conspiracy theory, said CBC, that the federal government is preparing to forcibly intern Canadians is patently false. The CBC assured Canadians the government was preparing, quote, voluntary quarantine sites. Yeah, voluntary in the sense of being mandatory, which is what they are. They're mandatory. And by the way, as a matter of science, how does packing infected people into crowded internment facilities reduce the spread of the coronavirus? That's a good question. And some have asked the Canadian government that very question, but they haven't explained. Unbelievable. These internment camps that are taking place in Canada. And what does it look like when you, let's say you leave the airport. In their case, if you don't quarantine in Canada, it is a five-year prison sentence and $1 million fine. $1 million for something that for 98 to 99% of people is like a common cold or a common flu. The bizarrety of the tyrants to use this narrative to control the populace, to do the great reset that they're enjoying, this incredible power to constrict the freedom and the liberty of citizens is unacceptable and it is disgusting. This regime that's going around the globe is very much like a boa constrictor that falls on an unsuspecting citizen and with each exhale of a breath, they cinch up until they choke the life out of you. That's why citizens are making a huge mistake when they think compliance will lead to greater liberty. Compliance is only the constriction that will slowly suck the life out of you. What's it look like when they come for you in your home as this took place in London? Look at them busting down a door and arresting a man for simply not quarantining for a flu. Any of this, right? You will be going to court for criminal damage and everything. We have kept them in. Let them do it. Do it. And I'll tell you now, no, you're supposed to be here to protect us. Protect us. You're here to. Martin, you're under arrest. 
for a breach of COVID no. regulations, you fail to quarantine in a designated hotel no. when instructed to do so. No. You do not have to say anything, but they harm your defence. If you do not mention it, it's yours. Something which you link to the line of course. Anything you do say right. may be given an evidence. Do you understand? Are you standing on they're reading him his rights. They busted down his door. They put handcuffs on him in his apartment in London for not going to a designated quarantine place. Well, he doesn't have to make that freedom of choice, does he, in Canada? They just escort you at night in a black vehicle with tinted windows and you end up in a place that looks like a sci-fi movie with plastic and hazmat suits. And if you're thinking that these are just things that happen in more extreme regimes, here's a democracy, supposedly, up north. We expect things like this video clip in China, where the Epic Times has now been uh, attacked four times by simply declaring and using their freedom of speech. Four armed guys with sledgehammers came in again this week and destroyed, and it's not the first time their printing presses have been attacked. Check this out. And the Epic Times printing house in Hong Kong was attacked Sunday night by intruders wielding hammers. The paper's spokesperson says they suspect that Chinese authorities are behind the attack. NTD's Penny Joe has more. Things are getting increasingly difficult for Hong Kong's independent media. Last night, the Epoch Times Hong Kong edition had their printing house smashed by hammer-wielding intruders. The four men barged into the printing plant and started destroying printing equipment. They also stole a computer. Now the news outlet has suspended printing due to the damage. The Epoch Times is the sister media of NTD. The paper is known to have drawn the ire of Chinese authorities. That's because they have reported extensively on human rights abuses in China and Beijing's crackdown on Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement. This is the fifth time the paper's printing facilities are attacked. The same printing house was set on fire in 2019. Hong Kong police say they still haven't found the suspects. The facility was also attacked in 2006 and twice in 2013. Police have not filed charges in any of the cases. China's leading the way for the world leaders today. They're exercising technocracy, which controls the technology of anybody. They have a cultural credit score that they're implementing there as they observe people, their citizens. They have seven, or, or one camera for every seven individuals in China. They have 200 million cameras for face recognition. They have one out of every 10 citizens that is an employee of the state that has to report and spy on all of its immediate neighbors and give the report every week. And the rest of the world is looking to China to say, how do you control your citizens? How do you control them? If your credit score gets, cultural credit score gets too low, you can't fly, you can't take a train. All of those things happen in nations that roll over and do not stand up for their liberty and their rights before it's too late. And we want to do that as we're sharing through these passages of Scripture in a few moments, and as we're telling you these stories, you go, well, that's happening in Canada. They busted in that apartment door in London. They did this uh, over in China. We expect that. Look at this interview I did with Pastor Imler up in uh, San Jose, as the police chased him all over the bay as he was simply wanting to worship the Lord in the United States of America. My name is Micaiah Ermler, and along with my wife, we pastor the Southridge Church here in San Jose. And so we've been church planning for about seven years. This in two weeks would be our seven year anniversary. And so we've been just hopping back and forth, location after location. And uh, we felt the call to stand up during COVID and take a stand. And so we did the first, on Easter Sunday, we rented the drive-in movie theater. And we were gonna have a drive-in service, everybody would stay in their cars. And we decided to do that. And when we were setting up church, we had about 500 cars there. And then we had eight police cars start rolling in. And then uh, they started finding us, said that was illegal. And they began to shut us down. For a drive-in movie. For a drive-in movie service. And so that began, and then the county kept coming after us. We went back the next week. They find, didn't find us, but then they find the uh, drive-in movie theater. So the drive-in movie theater kicked us out. Then we went to a mall parking lot, see if we could meet in the mall parking lot. They kicked us out. Went to a high school, same thing happened to high school. We went to a hotel, 
Same thing happened at a hotel. And then finally, Pastor McClure uh, helped us in our wilderness wandering and he invited us in. So we've been at Calvary Chapel since July. So we've been there almost seven months. And uh, meeting at night. At right. night, yeah. in the evenings. Yeah. We meet at 5 p.m. or well, Calvary Chapel meets in the morning. Yeah. And so we've been. What's the name of the fellowship? Oh, so it's Southridge Church. Southridge Church. Yes. So I want to show you guys the paperwork which is the new standard for preachers. Yes. If you are, uh, show me the front of it. We have legal documents in this hand and what's yep. in your other hand? Yep, the Bible. Got the word of God. So yeah. we got the citizen in the middle. <laughs> yes. You got legal paperwork. And we know of the tribe of Benjamin, there were some very gifted guys. They could fight with either hand. And yes. if you want to go yes. forward now, yes. right? You got to yes. learn to fight with every, either, exactly. hand. either hand. Up in Sarah, uh, Santa Clara County, with in the San Jose area, if you want to see the full extent of the exercise of tyranny and uh, the mask Nazis and everything that takes place up there, it's unbelievable. But now five churches are meeting at Calvary Chapel of San Jose that are displaced. They lost their facilities. They don't have a place to meet. So they're meeting at that facility. Therefore, that facility and that pastor and that congregation has $2 million in fines. Now, we're hoping the Supreme Court case that just came down this week that I believe was uh, very helpful in uh, promoting the uh, dismissal of our case here in Ventura County with God Speak Calvary Chapel and Pastor Rob McCoy will also be implemented up there. But uh, in the defense uh, team's efforts up there in San Jose, when they presented that this is a First Amendment issue, the judge brushed it aside as if the Constitution didn't even matter. We live in a generation where the politicians and the courts now treat the Constitution like some suggestions that are helpful when it uh, follows their political narrative, and they dismiss it out of hand when it does not follow their political narrative. Now, all of these things then brings it back home to us. When should God's people be civilly disobedient to tyrannical authority? There are two principles that we see throughout the Bible that I want to share with you as we wrap it up and really end with the hope that, you know, the beautiful thing is God's people always win. If they throw us in jail and persecute us, the gospel spreads. If they take our lives, they gave us the ticket to heaven. If they're giving us a hard time, then Jesus said, they, they hated me first, they're going to hate you. And those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. Having said that, there are two principles that you need to wrap your head around so that you're not one of these naive believers that, that does not exercise first your citizen rights of heaven, and your U.S. citizenship. We have been given by God these two incredible uh, weapons to go forward as we look at these things. Now, the first concept is we are civilly disobedient when the tyrants command us to do something that God forbids us to do. Case in point, we look at the story of the midwives when Pharaoh, this evil king, wanted to annihilate. He wanted to bring a genocide to the male population so that they could not rise up as an army. It tells us in Exodus 1, 15 through 22, Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra, and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was, because the midwives feared God, that he provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. You see, when the tyrant Pharaoh told the midwives, I want you to basically have a, a post-birth abortion to kill these male 
children because they, he was afraid of an army rising up. Now, he wanted the slaves, so females were fine. They could be slaves. He did not fear them as rising up as an army. But the midwives did not do what an evil tyrant told them to do, to take the life of newborn male children. And because of that, the Lord blessed them and took care of them and gave them households. This is civil disobedient from some midwives. Think of it. Some midwives. You know how terrifying it would be to have the authority of Pharaoh who can take life at any time to withstand that tyranny? Let me tell you, there's a special place in heaven for these incredible godly midwives that stood up for the lives of newborn male children. Next, we see another example of this. And in this example, we have Daniel. And he's told not to pray. In Daniel chapter 3, it says Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were told to bow down. They were told to do something God forbid, to bow down to idols. And it says Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. The three Hebrew children, as they're known, made a stand and said, we are not going to do what you're commanding us to do. You see, they were his employees. They worked for the court of the king, Daniel and his three friends. Now, these three friends said, you know what? Our God that we serve is supernatural. He's the God of the universe. He's the one true and living God. And he is able to deliver us from you. But if he does not, we are willing to face the consequences. We're willing to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And we know the story as it unfolds. The king is so angry with them. He orders it to be heated seven times hotter. They're thrown into there. And the people that threw them in actually were died from the extreme heat. And yet they were loosed from their bonds. And Nebuchadnezzar, as he looked at the fiery furnace, it says there was one like the son of the gods. And we believe theologically... And in this passage of scripture that it was the, none other than the Lord Jesus in his pre-incarnate or Christophany, as we say about an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. And when he showed up, he's walking with the Hebrew children. And you would think they'd want to get out of that fiery furnace, but his divine supernatural protection, the closeness of that fellowship, it appears that the three Hebrew children would rather be in the furnace in obedience to God than out walking around free under the power of a tyrant. And Nebuchadnezzar asked them to come out, and they came out, and Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged that their God was the true and living God. You see, it takes courage. It takes spiritual chutzpah. It takes some guts to stand up to tyrants. And these three individuals, they were willing to pay the price. Now, don't get me wrong. If you make a stand, you may pay a price. The ultimate price? your life. But what are you going to do? Threaten the child of God with paradise? You're going to threaten me? You're going to send me to heaven? Let's go. <laughs> Sign me up. I'm ready to go. In this example, we see two groups of people, really. The Hebrew midwives, they would not do what the king commanded. It was ungodly. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego would not do what the king commanded. Civil disobedience. You think these guys were ungodly? No, these guys were incredibly godly. But the second principle is when the government tells us not to do what God's told us to do. Check it out. When, when should God's people make a stand to do what he tells us to do? Obviously, God's told us to pray. So when the law was passed in Daniel 6.10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks to the uh, before his God. As soon as he saw the law was passed, that nobody could pray to anybody but to the king for 30 days, Daniel went home, opened his windows, faced Jerusalem, faced, you know, towards the east. That's the way, you know, they just pointed wherever Israel was or wherever they thought the proximity was, that direction, they would pray towards the Holy of Holies. And so he opened his windows and he prayed. And we, he went to the lion's den. God supernaturally protected him. And then he was delivered. And then the guys that were really trying to chop him off at the knees, they and their families were thrown into the lion's den and they were devoured. 
God can protect his people. In some cases, like James and Peter that are arrested, Herod chopped off the head of James, the very first of the apostles to be martyred. They gave him his ticket to go home to heaven. By the way, I mean, if you're going to go home, I think the beheading thing would be the fastest way to go. I'm not sure that I would like to be drawn and quartered or any of those kind of torture tactics, but heaven's not really a threat to the child of God. So when the government tells us we can't pray, we're going to pray. When the government tells us or the authorities tell us you can't preach, we're going to preach. Acts 4, verse 18 through 20. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. If they tell us not to pray, brothers and sisters, we're going to pray. If they tell us not to preach, we're going to preach about Jesus. And whatever the consequences are, we have to be willing to take those consequences. But what we're not going to do is become a prayerless people that no longer declare and preach the truth of the Word of God. Not only praying and preaching, but what about getting together and assembling? That's what they've told us we can't do. You Christians cannot get together. You must social distance. Or if you do get together with Pastor Coates up in Canada, he can only have 15% of the capacity of his sanctuary up there. We could only have uh, 25% of the capacity of our sanctuary. But look what Hebrews 10.25 tells us. It says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another as so much the more as you see the day approaching. What is the day approaching? We're in these last days, brothers and sisters, and if there's any time that you and I should be getting together and not being socially distanced and isolated, it's right now. And so, therefore, we have been gathering, we've been praying, we've been preaching, we've been gathering, and then they told us, well, you can get together only 25% of your sanctuary's capacity, but you may not sing and you may not chant, or if the whole congregation, chanting would be like all of us speaking the Lord's Prayer at the same time. But Colossians 3.16 tells us, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We want to be praising God. If you tell us not to pray, we're going to pray. If you tell us not to preach, we're going to preach. If you tell us not to gather, we're going to gather. If you tell us not to praise God with our voices and our song and to chant the Lord's Prayer or any passage of Scripture we want to, we're going to do it. And we are going to stand against tyranny. Now, we may pay that price. There may be a heavy price in the years to come. But as long as we're above ground, we know that the underground church flourishes around the world. But we're not underground yet, folks. And as long as we're above ground, I think we should be scrappy for our heavenly citizenship and our earthly citizenship here in the United States, using God's Word to guide and direct our heavenly citizenship and using the U.S. Constitution that is still valid and still on the books before the leftists remove it, burn it, dissect it, change it, turn it upside down, whatever they're going to do to it, and exchange it for the Communist Manifesto. So while we can, we must stand. Not only is this the case, and acts about us preaching the gospel, but what about what the normal weekly rhythm of church looks like? It tells us in Acts 2.42 and verses 46 and 47, you see, folks, this is what changes people's lives. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They're teaching the Word of God. In fellowship, they're sharing their lives with one another. In breaking bread, they're eating food. They're having communion together. In prayers, they're praying together. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple. They were meeting at the temple daily and breaking bread from house to house. So in a large gathering publicly in the temple and then house to house. This Supreme Court decision came down this week because the governor of California forbid more than three families to gather together in homes to have a home fellowship. Unbelievable. Unconstitutional. And this is the reason, not only for the church, but business owners, they're going after him to recall Governor Newsom. 
It goes on to say, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. You know, through this coronavirus time, the church is baptizing more in the last six months than it has the last few years. God is doing a work because you see our dual citizenship, as it says in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we also have an earthly citizenship, as we see Paul the Apostle in his Roman citizenship use that extensively through the book of Acts. It says, the commander in Acts 22 ordered him to be brought into the barracks, they arrested Paul, and said that he should be examined under scourging, which is a brutal, brutal way to uh, interrogate somebody, so that he might know why they shouted so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful? He's using his citizenship. He's using his constitutional rights. Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? He had not went through due process. There was no reason, and it was illegal for them to do so. When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, Yes. And the commander answered, With a large sum I obtained this citizenship. The Roman commander had to buy his citizenship, and Paul the Apostle said, But I was born a citizen. Were you born a citizen of the United States of America? And will you not lay hold of your constitutional rights as well as your heavenly citizenship? What I see that is the great disconnect for the Christian church and pastors and ministers and preachers from coast to coast, from the West Coast to the East Coast, from our northern border to our southern border, is they either make the mistake of emphasizing only the heavenly citizenship and they don't make a stand in the public arena for our U.S. citizenship. Or you have the opposite, those who begin to drift away from their heavenly citizenship, their Christ-centered relationship with God, and they're only political, thinking that all of our hope is wrapped up in Air Force One. Neither one of those things are true. We have to hold on to both of them. We have to hold on to both of them with a love for Jesus and a love for our nation and our heritage. And if we don't do those two things, brothers and sisters... We are going to go the way of so many tyrannical, oppressed peoples throughout history. So when will God's people awake? When will God's people arise? The Lord said of God's people, they were not to be the tail, but they were to be the head, which simply means we are to be leadership and not be the tail that's just falling along in blind compliance to these things. We only advocate prayerful preaching and gathering, peaceful protest. There is nothing in any of our rhetoric that wants anything to do with hatred or violence. None of those things. We are only advocating for citizens to rise up and use the rights that they have that are God-given and that our Constitution promises us as long as the Supreme Court will still enforce them. There is a day coming to this nation that those things may not be true. But that day is not now, and it is not going to be while we have breath in our lungs if we will stand and rise, and we will be a voice. God's people across America are the largest organization in all of this nation, the people of God, that we can pray for our leaders, we can speak, we can get involved with pu pu the public square, we can get involved with the political process, we can get involved with the school board, we can get on the city council, we can run for county supervisor, we can run for uh, the state legislature or the uh, federal congress, whatever it might be. We can get involved because we are doomed at, if we do not get good people. The problem is there is corruption from top to bottom in the political system because God's people have abdicated their role to be salt and light in a decaying, dying America. Paul the Apostle stood up as they were going to scourge him. It was against the law and he stood up for his rights.
in another opportunity when he was thrown in jail, and he didn't speak up. And I, this is a myster mysterious situation because he allowed them to beat him. He could have spoke up. Him and Silas were both Roman citizens. It says in Acts chapter 16, verse 35 through 37, when it was day, the magistrates sent the officers, this was after they were both beaten and imprisoned, unlawfully, illegally, saying, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, the magistrates, those government leaders, have sent to let you go. Oh, wasn't that good of them with their goodwill? Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now do they put us out secretly? No, indeed, let them come themselves and get us out. Let them come. They have broken the law. They have beaten us as uncondemned Romans. Those guys are in serious trouble. If Paul wants to push this case, these guys are in serious, serious hurt. Paul exercises his rights after the beating because, you see, he had established a church there in Philippi. And I'm convinced that it, God's providence, the way he led Paul to deal with this, that when he challenged them about his constitutional rights, if you will, in Rome, that they would leave those other believers alone. And those who are on the tip of the spear to stand against tyranny are going to pay a price, but the reason they're paying a price is to stand for God's people that may not be able to stand or have the gifts to stand or the ability to stand or the voice to stand. You see, the thing is about heroes throughout the history of God's people is someone will stand up and be a voice for the voiceless, that they will stand up strong for those who are weak. They will stand up filled with faith for those who are faltering in their faith. You see, it is time for good men to rise, good women to rise and to be a voice for the people of God with this dual citizenship. Lastly, Paul the Apostle finally appeals to the Supreme Court of the land of Rome, and that was to ask to stand before Caesar because he was getting unjust treatment in the court system. And that's what we've done all the way through this process. All the churches across the land, they go through the local courts, they go through the federal courts, they go through the district courts, and they arrive at the Supreme Court. This week, yesterday in fact, we were set free because of the Supreme Court appealing to our Caesar, if you will, the Supreme Court. It says in Acts 25, 9 through 10, as Paul the Apostle had been unjustly imprisoned for some time, it says, but Festus, who was the political uh, authority, wanted to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? So Paul said, I stand before Caesar's judgment seat. That means I appeal to the Supreme Court where I ought to be judged. To the Jews, I have done no wrong, as you very well know. I am innocent. Festus, you know it. Everybody knows it. The Jews know it. I have done no wrong. And so he appealed to Caesar. And to Caesar he was going to go. And it's not recorded in the scriptures, but historically, Paul the Apostle went and shared about the love of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection for the only hope of mankind to have forgiveness of sins and eternal life before Caesar Nero, the most powerful man in the Roman Empire and in the known world at that time. He was a voice. He was at the tip of the spear. Paul stood against tyrants. And he paid the price. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. He was in trouble with the law. It wouldn't look good on a modern-day resume as a preacher. But I'd rather have a resume that says, I stood up and spoke against the oppressor on behalf of the Lord and his people than I rolled over in a fetal position in a corner like a child to be compliant to tyrants. The beautiful truth is, the end result, God's people always win. We win. If you kill us, you go to, we go to heaven. If you persecute us, the gospel spreads. You throw us in jail, we'll have a prison ministry. There's nothing, once you've committed everything to the Lord, that God won't do. You and I should be filled with hope. The joy of the Lord is our strength because we have nothing to fear. Jesus exhorted us. He said, don't be afraid of men that the worst they can do is kill your body, but fear God who has the power to lift you up to heaven or to cast you down to hell. I say fear Him. And when men and women are filled with the fear of the Lord and the love of the Lord and a commitment to the Lord, 
they will turn their world upside down. Or in our case, folks, we're going to turn this place right side up and start right in your backyard to be salt and light for Jesus. Look forward to seeing you on our next installment of Vintage McCoy. God bless. Hey guys, thanks for watching. For more information, head over to VintageMcCoy.com or follow us on Instagram at The Vintage McCoy. We'll see you there.